how did Huss sing until the flames rendered his voice inaudible? There is a power outside of us that God gives us in that time of need. The average person becomes quite confused with this bewildering display of churches. And we've got to understand, as we've seen in the past, that the devil has many deceptions in the world today. And one deception is grasp onto any church that you want. Don't ask any questions. After all, they're all teaching the same salvation from the same Bible. But if this is true, why are there so many of them? And why are they all teaching something different? And the other side of the coin that the devil likes to flip out there is for one to become so cynical, so skeptical, that they rule out everything pertaining to religion. They say, oh, well, they can't even agree with themselves, and they only teach their individual dogmas. They are just all a bunch of hypocrites. You ever heard that? I hear it frequently. But as we look at the Bible, the Bible clearly describes why there are so many different denominations. And it helps us to see our way through this maze of confusion that exists today. You know, when Jesus was on the earth, he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus did not say that the gates of hell would not assail his church. And the church has been under assault from the beginning, but the devil will not prevail. Jesus built his church, but in those early centuries after he ascended back to the Father, man-made teachings begin to come into his church. And we've studied what some of those teachings are. And as we study the prophecies of Scripture, we understand what happened to the early church in those early centuries and also why these things happened. And one of the most amazing prophecies in the Scriptures is in the book of Revelation with chapter 6 and onward. And so that's where I want us to begin tonight. If you would take your Bible, go to the 6th chapter of Revelation, and we're going to read these first eight verses. Revelation chapter 6, and we're going to take a look at what is referred to as the seven seals. It's on page 1222 in that seminar Bible there. Beginning with verse 1 of Revelation 6, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard as it were the noise of thunder, and one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard a second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld a low, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death, and Hell followed with him, and power was given unto him over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword, and with hunger, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. These four seals here are oftentimes referred to as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Here we see the Lamb open the seals, and out come these four riders. Now, the four horsemen are revealing to us the progression of the church during that period of time. 
There was the white horse, the red horse, the black horse, and then the pale, sickly-looking horse with death riding it. Who is the lamb, though? Jesus. He is the lamb of God. So we are reading about Jesus opening the seals of history here. And as he opens these seals, we see that we are going to have Jesus explaining to us exactly what took place in the early Christian history. This is not man's idea. It is not some human or church revelation of history, but it is the Lamb of God, the Lamb that died for us. We see in this book of the revelation of Jesus Christ, our Lord himself presenting to us in advance what was going to happen in his church. And John, in prophetic vision, looks up, and he sees the four horsemen riding there across heaven. And remember, Bible prophecy is often filled with symbols. And these symbols are very important to us. It was Confucius that said a long time ago that a picture is worth what? A thousand words. We all know that. A picture is worth a thousand words. And so here God uses prophetic pictures to help us understand the history and the future of the Christian church. And so as Jesus opens the first of the seals, out comes this rider on a white horse, and the horse gallops across heaven. He explodes off of the pages of the Bible to us tonight, and this is what those first two verses of chapter 6 said. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. You see, remember, John was exiled to the island of Patmos by the Romans, and he's writing in his exile there, and God is presenting a vision to him in a language that John could understand. You see, John knew that generals, the Roman generals, often rode white horses, horses that were a symbol of their triumph. A white horse was ridden by generals in Rome once they had triumphed over their enemies. And so Jesus is pictured as triumphantly riding through the first century in the Christian church. The white horse that we're looking at, with a bow in his hand, represented the Christian faith. In fact, one Roman writer in that first century said, you are everywhere, speaking of the Christian church. He says, you are in our armies, you are in our navies, you are in our senate, you are in our marketplaces, you are in our universities, you are everywhere. Even Paul talked about the church that was in the household of Caesar. And that Caesar, when Paul wrote that, was Nero. So Christianity went everywhere. And in the New Testament, white regularly symbolizes apostolic purity, a church with pure doctrines. And so this white horse in Revelation chapter 6 represents the doctrines and the, and the Christian church conquering. It was a conquering faith that went around the world. By the time that Paul died, he'd already written that the gospel had been preached to every creature under heaven. You see how, how powerful the gospel went out. We also see in Revelation chapter 12, we studied some time back about this woman that was dressed in white, again representing the pure faith. And so here in that early Christian era, the disciples armed with the word of God and filled with the Holy Spirit and a love for Christ went forward preaching the gospel. Notice again what it tells us in Scripture in Colossians chapter 1. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven. The gospel had made a mighty impact upon this New Testament period, and a band of 12 disciples filled with the Holy Spirit 
took the gospel to the ends of the earth. In the book of Acts, we find in the fifth chapter, it says that believers were the more added to the Lord, multitudes, both of men and of women. As a matter of fact, the book of Acts says, and the Lord added to the church daily those that should be saved. And those that came into the church in those early centuries were very, very convicted of one very important thing, and that is that we ought to obey God rather than man. So when the church grew, it was pure, and when it was when it based its doctrines upon the Bible and the Bible alone, God blessed. But when the faith of the New Testament church was honored, God honored the church. And Satan saw that the church was growing and triumphing. And so Satan figured he had to change his approach. Now today, most Christians today say, oh no, we don't have to obey God. We can obey man, and we've studied that. They prove it by saying we don't have to keep the Sabbath day anymore. We can keep the day that man has made. They say that we don't have to believe certain teachings of the Bible anymore. They've been done away with. You see, there is not that intense feeling of necessity of obedience to God like there used to be. But I ask tonight, do you believe that we ought to obey God rather than man? We must all come to believe that. And so we find that this New Testament church, this pure church that triumphed and carried the gospel everywhere, was from about 31 to 100 A.D. That was the first century of the Christian church, from basically the time of Jesus up until the time of the death of the Apostle John. But the second seal opens there, and when he opened the second seal, out came this red horse, this red horse, and it says very clearly in verse 4, there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to what? To take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another, and there was given to him a great sword. So Satan saw he could not destroy that early Christian church, that it was moving on in triumph, and so he raised up a very vicious persecution. Christians were martyred. They were burned at the stake, and they came forward as a people who had a blood-stained faith. Many, many people gave up their lives, and as the church was being persecuted, the Roman armies first of all, marched against them. It was, remember, the Roman armies that crucified Christ. Yeah, the Sanhedrin was behind it. It was the Roman armies that sought to stop the Christian faith. And so the Roman armies went out trying to destroy the Christian faith, and emperors like Decius and, and uh, Diocletian, that 10-year period between those two people, the church was almost exterminated. The Christians during that period of time were carried into uh, the Colosseums. They were burned alive. They were fed to lions. They were uh, every despicable thing that you could think of was heaped upon those early Christians, but yet they remained faithful to God. But over the years, I don't know how many people have said to me such things as, well, Pastor, if I make this decision to follow Christ, my husband will really get angry with me, or my wife may leave me, or my parents will get angry. Some of them say, if I make this decision, I will probably lose my job because I accept the Bible Sabbath, or it's too difficult for me because I still love my alcohol, my tobacco, my other things that the Word of God has forbidden. But I want you to think about it tonight, friends. Think about what those early Christians faced. So many Christians today want an easygoing, accommodating Christianity. But every test that we face makes our faith stronger. 
Every time that we stand for God, he gives us the power and the strength to do what we could never have done before. The martyrs, they did not face the lions alone. They did not face the torture. They did not stand alone when they were burned at the stake as Tyndale was that we studied, uh, watched tonight. God gave these people an extra power, power that we can't understand. How did Huss sing until the flames rendered his voice inaudible? There is a power outside of us that God gives us in that time of need. And so this red horse period of persecution extended from about 100 to 313. But in 313 now, Christianity, for the first time, has become legal. Not until the time of Constantine was it legal to be a Christian. But when he opened that next seal and that black horse came out, all kinds of blackness began to engulf the church of the living God. It says, And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances and in his in his hand and I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say a measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny and see that thou hurt not the oil or the wine you see these prices that are mentioned here are famine prices there is a famine in the land but it is not a famine for food it is a famine for the word of God and God says hurt not the oil which was the Holy Spirit, or the wine, which was the blood of Jesus Christ. And so during this period of time, some tremendous things begin to happen. You see, in that time of persecution, for all of that period of time up until 313, 200 years plus of vicious persecution, you see, Tertullian, one of the early writers of that period, said that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the gospel. And so the gospel continued to grow during the time of persecution. And no matter how many Christians were killed, when their blood was shed, others seemed to rise up to take their place. Others picked up the torch of faith and carried it on, even at the risk of their own lives. And so Satan knew he could not destroy the church by persecuting it. And so the more he persecuted these Christians, the more faithful they became. The more stalwart they became in their faith, the more courageous they became, and the church grew and grew. So Satan now changed his strategy to go to this next horse, this third seal, and as a result, the faith of God's people were now being compromised. You see, Christianity was legal. And the Roman Emperor Constantine professed to be a Christian. And so the popular thing to do was to join the emperor's church. So Satan could not stop the church. So he decided to bring pagans and corrupt teachings into the church and to dilute the faith of God's people. And Paul had warned about that. In the book of Acts, Paul said, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock to feed the church of God. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. So you see, from outside the church and from within the church, compromise began to take place within the early Christian church. The church would grow, the church would become popular, and pagans would come into the church. As a matter of fact, Daniel had prophesied this all the way in the 8th chapter. He said that this power would cast down the truth to the ground and it would practice and it would prosper. And so Bible doctrines that were taught by the, the apostles were now removed from the church 
and other doctrines that, doctrines that they'd never heard of, doctrines of men and cunningly devised fables were brought into the church. Some of these are that salvation through Christ alone was now replaced by obedience to the requirements of the church. You saw this in the movie tonight. You must be obedient to the church because the church is above the gospel. These things began to come in at a very early period. Church councils and church dogmas began to take the place of the pure word of God, and substitutes were made. Substitutes for the very commandments of God. And the church thought they had the right, the authority, to remove the fourth commandment and replace it with the pagan Sunday. They thought they had the right to remove the teachings about idolatry and images. You know, one question that was raised by those early church leaders and early state leaders was simple. And I hate to say it, it's being asked by church leaders today. How can we make Christianity more accommodating to the pagans or to the unbelievers? We use the word unbelievers today, but it's the same group of people. What can we do to make the church more appealing to the world? How can we help those hordes of pagans that are coming into the church to feel more comfortable when they get here? And so they began to make changes, just as we are still making changes for that today. And one of the things that they came up with back then was, well, why don't we take some of those pagan gods and bring them into the church and rename them in harmony with the saints? And so, for example, when you look at this picture here, this picture is supposedly a picture of St. Peter. If you go over to Rome and you go to St. Peter's, you'll see that the toes are pretty well kissed off of this statue. But if you check your history, you will see, friends, that this is not St. Peter at all. History reveals that it is a statue of Jupiter that the early church took and put it up and said, this is Peter. And who was going to refute it? Because nobody had a photograph of Peter. But if you look at the statue very closely, you'll see the sun disk on the head of Jupiter there. And we forget God's commandment that says, You shall not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. So why did the early church begin to take those things out, those commandments? Because they began to put those statues and those images inside of their church. So you see what's going on. Images of the saints were made as intercessors for the people rather than the Holy Spirit who is our intercessor. It is the saints that must carry our prayers to God rather than the Spirit of the living God. And so changes begin to occur in those early centuries. Daniel foretold this in Daniel 7.25 when he said this power would think to change times and laws. But you know, when we look back at the early apostolic creed, remember in the beginning of the movie this evening, the children were there and then she was quoting and all of a sudden he said, you can't do the apostolic creed or the Lord's Prayer, you can't do any scripture in English. Let's take a look at what that apostolic creed said that he referred to. O Lord Almighty, thou hast created the world by Jesus Christ and has appointed the Sabbath in memory thereof. You see, that was the apostolic creed. During the age, though, of compromise, the pagans' day of sun worship replace the Bible Sabbath. Why? How did it happen? Remember, Constantine himself was a pagan until his professed conversion. And upon his professed conversion, he supposedly had a vision there of the sun with the cross in it. And he never turned loose of his sun god. As a matter of fact, his decree said that you have to keep the day of the sun 
holy. You can't do any work upon it. Eusebius, who was a contemporary of Constantine, tells us that Constantine, in order to recommend the new religion to the heathen, transferred to it the outward ornaments to which they had been accustomed in their own. You see what's going on here, my friends. Constantine wanted to make the church more acceptable to the pagans out there. And so what he did was he brought pagan customs into the church. They transferred the ornaments of paganism to the Christian church. Images and the worship of the sun or Sunday. In fact, Constantine's coins had a picture on one side of himself and on the other side of the sun god. Notice what Arthur Stanley tells us. He says, Constantine's coins bore on the one side the letters of the name of Christ, on the other the figure of the sun god, as if he could not dare to relinquish the patronage of the bright luminary. Constantine and his army, yeah, they became Christians according to history, but it is also told us in history that Constantine and his army rode their horses through the river while the bishop held up his hand standing on dry land and says, I now baptize you. Baptize the whole army and the horses too, I guess, in one shot. But it was Constantine who could not give up that allegiance. And from that point on, they would conquer other armies and march them up to a river and tell them either you get in and be baptized or we will kill you where you stand. Well, those pagans jumped in the water. And the only difference when they came out of the water was you now had a bunch of wet pagans. And it has carried on through the church even to this day. Remember this from history on pertaining to Diasolus. The retention of the old pagan name, Dies Solis, or Day of the Sun, or Sunday, is in great measure owing to the union of pagan and Christian sentiment with which the first day of the week was recommended by Constantine to his subjects, pagan and Christian alike, as the venerable day of the sun. You see what's happening. Compromise is taking place. Pagan and Christian sentiments and teachings are being intermingled. If we look at the Catholic Encyclopedia, that Church of Rome tells us itself that the Church, the Roman Catholic Church, after changing the day of rest from the Jewish Sabbath or seventh day of the week to the first, made the third commandment refer to Sunday as the day to be kept holy as the Lord's day. Now notice what they just said. We talked on this a few weeks ago. They made the third commandment refer to what? What happened to the fourth commandment? Remember the fourth commandment, Exodus 28 through 11, is the Sabbath commandment. So why is the Catholic Church now got it as the third commandment? Well, remember, they took away the second one, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images, and they moved them all up one, so that now number four became number three, and guess what? When they got to the bottom, they only had nine commandments. And everybody knows there's ten commandments. So what could they do? They took the tenth commandment and split it in half and made two commandments out of it. Thou shalt not worship, or not, thou shalt not covet your neighbor's wife, number nine. And number ten, thou shalt not covet anything else that's his. And now they got ten commandments again. With the second one gone, the fourth one moved to third place and changed from Sabbath to Sunday. Friends, this is just as we see in the Old Testament where the prophet Ezekiel talked to Israel's religious leaders when they profaned the Sabbath day and God's law. The same principle back then applies to what happened in the fourth century under Constantine and the church leaders. Notice what God cried out to ancient Israel in Ezekiel 22. 
Her priests have violated my law and profaned my holy things. They have not distinguished between the holy and the unholy, nor have they made known the difference between the unclean and the clean. And they have hidden their eyes from my Sabbaths, so that I am profaned among them. You see that? As in Israel's time, it was happening in the fourth century. It is happening still today. As ministers continue to disregard God's law, disregard his Sabbath, make no distinction between, between clean and unclean. It's still going on. But back in that time with Constantine, there was a union of church and state. And we see that that is going to come about again. You see, this black horse...